why I find social structures of accumulation such a very useful kind of paradigm. Um, I'm interested in the part of the Indian economy which is outside the control of the state. And you may be surprised to find that that is to over two-thirds of the Indian economy, at least half of which is also black. And the question which arises is, um, and I think people who fly into India and don't go on the Golden Triangle holiday um, may think that India is chaotic, but it's not at all chaotic. So the question is, what brings order to the part of the economy which is outside the control of the state? And I've called this various things. I mean, it is called the in informal economy, um, even though the concept of informality has been trashed in sociology. Um, but it does draw attention to the division between the state and the rest of the economy. But I've also called it the economy of the 88%. Because only 12% of the Indian population live in metropolitan cities or towns above 200,000. The rest are living in villages with small market towns. And if, or in the economy of the 88%, only about 10 to 15% of their consumption expenditure comes from the formal or the corporate sector. So we've got an enormous problem on our hands. Accumulation in India isn't chaotic, but what brings order to it? So um, in my project, I've looked at um, I've, I've looked at the way in which the processes of class formation, that is capital and labor, and the, the way the state operates outside its own formal reach, the, the existence of a parallel or shadow state that's dependent on the actually existing formal state, um, how they structure the informal economy. And I've also looked at institutions which sociologists talk about in terms of identity, that is gender and religion in the plural. What are the implications of there being many religions for the economy? Um, and caste. Um, and also, how all this is mapped onto space. And I've asked those questions that people following the social structure of accumulation paradigm ask, which is, how do these institutions regulate the economy? And how do they regulate accumulation and stabilize it? Um, and how do they control labor? So that's the project. It's completely incomplete. I haven't looked at ethnicity, I haven't looked at nation, I haven't looked at language, and heaven only knows what else I haven't looked at. But I do believe that this is a social structure of accumulation. Um, and the totality of these relations gives India its Indianness. So in principle, this project ought to be multiplied wherever, um, wherever there are large um, components of the economy which are not state controlled not formally controlled. Um, it's hard enough doing it in cross-section, which is what I've done, but I haven't done it in long waves, and I don't think anybody I know has even begun to think about all that. And the periodization of growth in India is extremely contentious. Um, uh, Monte Alwalia, who's sort of finance supremo in India, came to Oxford just a few days ago, and he just sh showed that growth has oscillated between 5 and 6% right the way through for decades and decades. So the very problem of periodizing uh, a growth, a business cycle in India is, is hugely contentious. Um, and as for liberalization, I need to remind everybody that labor in India has always been free in the sense that only 7% have ever belonged to unions. Um, labor is quite free to be exploited in all kinds of oppressive ways um, and not um, yoked under any kind of, of, of labor laws. And um, 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 what I also haven't done is linked a local SSA to a global SSA. And on that, what we started to talk about this, this morning, which is very fascinating, is the idea that there's a global SSA, but that there must be at least two, two kinds of forms. One is the formal uh, global, formal structures of globalization, but the other is the informal structures of globalization and the role of offshore financial havens in Libya, the, the two kinds of globalizations. Anyway, so that's my project. And that's why I'm here. And my students are pursuing this, some of them anyway, um, by looking at um, the, the roles of class and identity in civil society and in the state itself, as well as in industrial classes. Um, and this is very interesting theoretically because if we start using, uh, applying the questions that were arising yesterday to these kinds of structures of accumulation, there are really big theoretical problems, and there are problems of knowledge as well. Um, how do we look at over-determination de over um, when many of these institutions are operating outside the economy as well as inside the economy, and change outside the economy is going to affect change inside the economy and vice versa? And is actually 
separating the economy from the non-economy very useful analytically, I begin to wonder. Um, and it's a multidisciplinary project, and not necessarily methodologically, but in terms of where the evidence is coming from. It's coming from law, anthropology, politics, history, feminist studies, all kinds of things, as well as uh, geography, as well as um, economics. And because most of the formal databases are looking at states and outcomes and not processes, and this whole project involves looking at processes, then it depends to a, a huge extent on the primary field work, which again constrains what can be known. Okay, so in this project, we're um, rejecting looking at these social structures styled as networks, as so much um, sociology does, or styled as faction, which is how politics likes to, to do it, because faction glosses over the specific, or both of them gloss over the specificities of power, and, and reducing society to nodes and flows destroys all the specificity um, and uh, destroys most of the point of this whole project. And we also reject all but a very essential analytical simplification. So when we talk about gender, it's important to ask the question, what is patriarchy in India? But when we then, and, and to try and answer it, but having answered it, we then have to de-essentialize because we have to map one kind of power in the economy onto all the other kinds of power, including class formation. So it's a very, very, very complicated method that you have to use, or forced to use, if you follow this path. Another thing which gets me in trouble with the left is that um, we are rejecting um, all, all kinds of what the left calls non or archaic forms of exchange or, or, or pre capitalist relics. And we're arguing that the whole point of these things is that they, they are reworked to form part of modern Indian capitalism. And they are just as modern as the corporation in India. They are part of the social structure of accumulation. They are not something that is about to be destroyed. Um, they are being reworked and possibly transformed, but not destroyed. And nor do we try to deduce, as rational choice theorists do, um, process from outcome, because process is the thing that we're trying to problematize. And um, very often, if you do that, you get a, a spurious kind of analysis. So we want to study process directly. We have to grapple with the fact that um, it, it, in economies regulated in this way, and possibly in all economies, there are directly opposite processes going on. One very good example is um, labor. Um, in India, you can very easily walk into a steel factory and see the cosmopolitanization of the labor force, uh, the opposite of segmentation. But you can walk outside the steel factory into the market town, servicing the steel factory, and you will find not only labor, but also capital is extremely segmented and, and um, it, in ways which we're studying. So we have to try to theorize the coexistence of opposite processes inside this structure of accumulation. And the last thing that we want to problematize and, and, and reject is the presumption of the autonomy of the state or, ne or that the state is necessarily the wing of capital. Anyway, the, the Weberian presumption that the office holder is separate from their private interest, that the private interest is not necessarily just a class interest. So in this example, I'm going, going to apply this to tax. Tax is extremely interesting because it's the a key indicator of state capacity and state legitimacy. Um, and I'm using a concept derived from Schumpeter of tax culture. Um, Schumpeter had a whole paradigm of fiscal sociology and fiscal history in which development was conceived as that set of arrangements where um, surplus was directly grabbed by a ruler from um, his own properties, um, right through to a situation which we can model now where taxes um, the state's resources are garnered through private levies, which are voluntarily, more or less voluntarily, yielded up because there's a consensus between capital and rulers. And in order to do that, there has to be an independent public sector bureaucracy. So for Schumpeter, the whole of development is encapsulated in this idea of fiscal sociology. And yet we have to contrast the existence of this admirable sort of parable of development with the fact that, um, on the one hand, the economies of Eastern Europe and the, the former Soviet Union, which are trying to, um, to move from public ownership and a huge informal economy, I should add, um, through to this kind of consensus in which private companies yield tax on the one hand, and the IMF trying to use some kind of reduced, reduced form concept of, 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 of tax culture to, get, to try to persuade um, large firms to pay tax in developing countries. It's been extremely unsuccessful. That, that attempt to socially engineer tax culture 
is singularly unsuccessful. And in my paper, I hazard the guess that one of the reasons that it's unsuccessful in developing countries is that um, Marx's primary or original accumulation is not dead and gone in one era of history, but is alive and kicking and is logically necessary, even in, um, I I even in the modern world, that you have two processes, several processes of accumulation going on side by side, one of which, which is rampant, is primitive. Um, and what um, Adam Smith called prehistory, capitalist prehistory, um, we have this irony that prehistory continues right up <coughs> to the present era. Another problem is that the, ta the language and the tax culture of tax officials themselves are just never studied. So um, to Schumpeter's concept of tax culture consisting of formal rules and structures we need to add the informal institutions of identity and tax officials culture, their world, their, um, in a non-Marxist sense, what, what, what you often called actors, and the creation of tax practice by tax officials and the mediated relations between tax authority and tax payers. Now, India is a terrific place to study this. Um, it's one of the most corrupt and um, non-compliance societies in the world. I, mean, I think the latest um, listing of regions of the world that, um, puts the Middle East first and South Asia second as, as big regions in which um, there are problems of non-accountability, corruption, and poor governance. And poor reven revenue collection is clearly um, at the very heart of the fiscal crisis of the Indian state. <coughs> Furthermore, India has tried to introduce VAT, a, a very much simplified form of what exists now. And it's, it was met in last, midway through last year by a three-day strike by traders. And it has been very, very difficult to implement VAT. Um, and the state in which I'm going to describe all this is Tamil Nadu in the south on the bottom right. And Tamil Nadu is a very good state within a very good country because it was the original site of sales tax, commercial taxes. And commercial taxes supply the state with two-thirds of its own revenue. Um, and the role of commercial taxes in the revenue stream of this state is, is increasing, as it is in most states in India. And furthermore, Tamil Nadu has one of the best tax bureaucracies in India, very self-consciously aware of the role of tax and of the role of the bureaucracy in raising tax. Okay. That's the first <laughs> That's the first time back of which I forgot to put on. Um, okay, so what did, what did we find? We did field work on all this. Um, the sort of stakeholder field work. And we looked at the Tamil Nadu General Sales Tax Act, which was passed in 1959 and has been amended so many times and in so many contradictory ways that there is what we call, it's a sort of euphemism, we call it informed imprecision. Um, about its understanding. But what that means is that absolutely nobody understands it. It's a bit like a common agricultural policy. Nobody understands the law. Well, several, the, the um, what's the other one? Uh, um, the Essential Commodities Act is another act that has been amended 60 or 70 times, and nobody has a complete grasp of, of the meaning of that act. So that part of the background to tax culture is that the law is understood in idiosyncratic ways. And there's a big tension between the minimization of distortions in the interest of old dear. <laughs> Some kind of, yeah, I, know, I know I've got to stop. Um, <laughs> minimization of distortions in the interest of industrial competition policy and the maximum maximization of revenue, since each state has a revenue crisis. And um, what we find then is that there are something like 65 exempt goods um, in, in the current commercial taxes structure, and many more goods which are, in a sense, underexploited because taxable income is far um, disproportionate to the actual tax raised. And there's a politics behind this. It's not hazardous. It's quite systematic. Um, these are um, the, the biggest industry outside agriculture, which is the textile industry. Various manifestations of that are under tax. Agro-industrial um, trade goods, the raw materials to agro-industry, are under tax as well. I'm going to have to race. So the whole point is that when we, as um, people in development, conceive that sort of policy is something that's technically sweet and neutral, 
and that the problem is how policy is implemented. In this case, we see that even in its inception and its various amendments, amendments, this tax policy is not technically neutral at all, but it's deeply embedded in class and caste because the commodities which are not taxed or undertaxed are those um, whose control is dominated by um, the intermediate classes, we model, and um, uh, the dominant classes in outside metropolitan areas in India, and the castes, which map almost completely onto these classes. Furthermore, we see that the tax bureaucracy is as much the object of, of capture by these regionally dominant castes, there, for those who know Belarus and Nadas, um, as is party politics, which is a continual pendulum <coughs> between um, Dravidian nationalist parties. So we have a mapping of caste and class onto a whole set of privileges in the tax policy. However, the tax policy practices are not completely captured. There's a kind of very peculiar um, idiosyncratic indeterminacy between rule-based behavior by tax officials and interest-based behavior by them. Um, furthermore, of course, there are mechanisms by which um, Tax policy is monitored and evaluated and improvements are suggested. And there happen to be two, two formal mechanisms. And in my paper, I describe them at some length. Um, all I want to say, because there's no time, is that the balance of power in these two formal mechanisms, one of which is through the organogram of the tax bureaucracy, and one of which is coming up from the district to some kind of apex body in which industry, the people who control insidiously control the tax policy are really <coughs> powerfully represented where there's a hidden politics at play. The balance of power through this hidden politics is shifting away from the technocrats, the people like us, um, and the civil service towards these Dravidian parties and these dominant class and caste interests. Right, that's what I want to say about um, the tax, the state and tax culture, and now society and tax culture. Um, I'm going to have to go into overdrive. Um, but <laughs> either miss a lot out or speak very quickly. I'm going to miss a lot out. The key sort of messages um, are that the, <coughs> there is a very pervasive culture of tax avoidance and of tax evasion. That um, commercial taxes are levied on companies whose gross output um, exceeds about 6,000 euros since we're in Ireland. Um, and that 0.1% of the firms that are registered and liable provide 57% of all tax. And these are the big companies with, and I've worked it out in euros, turnovers of 15 million euros and above. And they are liquor and diesel and petrol and, and industries like that. Um, and, and there is a sort of social political settlement between these very big companies that supply the state with most of its resources through commercial taxes and what they get back from the state because they need decent industrial estates, constant supply of electricity, drainage and latrine, um, sanitation, they need all the roads, <coughs> they need these things and they get these things and there's a massive contrast between these on the one hand and um, the, the trading sector on the other, mostly um, electrical goods and edible oils and jewellery, um, which um, evade like hell. And, and the estimates, because we can only do this through estimates, are somewhere in the region of 70 to 90 percent of obligations are evaded. Um, so the manufacturing, the, the big sector, the sector that's actually the, the universal donor and the universal recipient from the state, um, also practices avoidance where it possibly can through mechanisms that we've talked about already, registration, transfer pricing, um, and so on and so forth. And the mass of firms which evade rather than avoid um, do this by forged accounts and by um, attributing everything to agriculture, which is the tax. So there's a lot of fraud, not, not just tax avoidance because you're operating out of an agricultural site, but fraudulent attribution of um, your jewellery business to agriculture, and um, very common garbage bribery and corruption. Um, and of course it's the uh, large sort of substrate of firms, which I call the intermediate classes, uh, which are very costly, transactions costly to tax, 
huge numbers of firms who have to plod around and threaten them. Um, so, so it's much easier to tax the elite firms manufacturing capital, and much more difficult to tax the rest. And um, since it is difficult to tax the rest, you have a whole um, you have a perception that the inspections and the tax demands that are made are arbitrary. They appear to be arbitrary to people in this class, and to mediate between. Thank you. To mediate between them uh, and the state, there is uh, a whole cadre of tax consultants. And the tax, the thing to know about them is that they're not qualified in chartered accountants. They're not chartered accountants. Their qualification is experience. And they're generally the same caste as the caste that dominate the tax bureaucracy, which is the same caste as the caste that have got the exemptions. So they're the kin, or, or they're actually retired tax officials themselves. So, so that there is a huge penumbra of tax consultants who protect um, and try to mediate between the tax evaders and, um, and, and the state. Tax literacy, uh, it all takes place in English, and only 5% of the population speaks in English. So there's a terrible problem of ignorance. And therefore, the information comes through rumour and it comes through the experience of being um, invaded and harassed, harassed by the tax groups. Conclusion. Um, no tax, taxation without representation. The point about all this is the informal and illegal nature of the re relations of representation. There is a tax culture. It's pervasive and it's a, tax, a culture of non-compliance. Officials regard taxpayers as selfish and criminal, and taxpayers regard officials as predatory and corrupt. And this tax culture compromises the capacity of the state because uh, the state's own practices are derived from values which um, themselves reflect the class and caste interests um, and the ethnicity and the party political allegiances of many of the tax for 